Hello, welcome to Khan Academy Ed Talks. I am Caroline Hu Flexer, the CEO and co founder of Khan Academy Kids, which is a mobile app for children two through eight that's focused on literacy, math, and social emotional learning. Today, we are celebrating National Reading Month, and I am excited to talk with our special guest, Christy Yamaguchi, who is a Olympic gold medalist, author, and philanthropist. If you have questions for Christy, please drop them into the chat. And before we get started, I want to remind you that Khan Academy is a nonprofit organization. We're able to do the work that we do thanks to the generosity and donations from folks like all of you. So if you're able to give, please go to khanacademy.org slash donate and you'll find a place where you can make that donation. And we are so grateful for anything that you can give to our mission. I also wanted to recognize the organizations that have helped support our work during the pandemic, including AT&T, General Motors, and Fastly. Finally, if you want to listen to this podcast again or find previous broadcasts, you can find them at Homeroom with Sal, the podcast, anywhere you get your podcast. So let's get started. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Christy Yamaguchi. She is a wife, mother, Olympic gold medalist, children's book author, and founder of the nonprofit Always Dream. Christy Yamaguchi's Always Dream ensures that children from low-income families have access to high-quality books. Welcome, Christy. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Caroline. It's great to join you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Yeah. So the Winter Olympics just finished. This year is your 30th anniversary since capturing the gold medal. What is your most cherished memory you have regarding your Olympic experience? And we'd love to hear a bit more about what the Olympics were like back then. Yeah, so 92 was a while back, right? But uh, it was an incredible experience. I think uh, when you talk to any Olympian, one of the most vivid and fondest memories is always marching in the opening ceremonies. And I think just being a part of a, an incredible group of athletes, not just figure skaters, but, you know, the skiers, the speed skaters, the bobsledders, Biathlons, it's just an incredible pool of talent and it's so humbling. And I think there's no prouder feeling than, you know, putting on our Team USA uniforms and, and marching in together uh, representing our country. So, uh, so that I think will always be an incredible special moment. And, you know, the games themselves are just, um, you know, something that's a, a lifelong pursuit. And it's it's so amazing uh, just to be there and an honor to represent. But, uh, you know, the competition gets a little intense, <laughs> as you can imagine. Wow. But, uh, you know, lots of fun too. I mean, I knew I was prepared and I was ready for that moment. And even though my nerves were, you know, creeping in and, and giving me a little bit of uh, that scary feeling, I kept telling myself, you know, go out there, do what you're trained to do, and uh, the preparation is going to hopefully uh, be, you know, something I can rely on. And it, and it came through for me. So I um, feel very fortunate every day. Yeah, it clearly did. And, and I'm sure there were many life lessons that you learned as a figure skater. What were some of those that carried over into your work now in raising and teaching kids? Uh, I mean, that's such a great point. And I think it's all about having a dream, right? And really going after those dreams and, uh, and really encouraging kids to use their imaginations and to open up their minds to what's possible out there. And, uh, and then, you know, putting the time in and working for it. So, you know, all good stuff to kind of set goals and, you know, encourage uh, the kids to like really go after what they want and, and put some work or, or, you know, effort into it. And you never know what can happen. Absolutely. It's that combination of the hard work and the dreams that, that yes, clearly have sure. taken you this far. Yeah. Uh, so you've written three books and you are also um, working um, with early childhood literacy. How did you 
get into that from figure skating? And you, you started quite early in your career as well. Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, my organization Always Dream was established in 1996. And uh, we were all about uh, embracing the hopes and dreams of uh, underserved children. And the last 10 years, we've really focused our efforts on the early childhood literacy. And I think really the inspiration behind that was being a mom, becoming a mom myself. I had, uh, I still have two daughters, but at the time they were four and six. So kind of at that learn to read age, um, you know, had an incredible high interest in books and just, you know, reading at home. And I think my husband and I just saw the incredible value that that had and, and the, the pure benefits that they received from it as they were starting to get ready for school. And um, I think, you know, looking around in our country and some of the statistics of, you know, 60% of low income families don't have age appropriate books in the home. And, you know, close to, you know, 40% of our fourth graders in the United States are, uh, you know, reading at or above grade level. I mean, those are numbers we really want to change. And I felt like um, that was something I, I was really passionate about and uh, wanted to really turn our focus on. Absolutely. And, and now you're working with school districts and, and using technology to help um, get those resources into classrooms. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, yeah, so we have a program called Always Reading, and uh, it's focused on uh, pre-kindergarten and uh, kindergarten age students. And we're primarily in uh, Title I schools, so where resources are, are very much needed, and uh, provide one-to-one -one, uh, tablet with eBooks. And uh, so a wide range of selection of titles and subjects for the kids to pick from. Uh, but we also pair that with family engagement support. And with that support, we reach out to the families three times a week with text messages. And there's everything from uh, reading tips and strategies to little gentle reminders of like, hey, there's 10 new books in your library, you know, why don't you pick one out and read to your child tonight? Um, and some, you know, and sometimes uh, questions to maybe ask your kids as they're, they're re you're reading a book with them together. So, um, you know, it, it's a it's a program that we really, really love to see the change in behavior of the families at home, that they do set up a literacy rich environment with their child and spend that time engaging with them and uh, and just understand the importance and the impact that that will have on their child as they move uh, forward in, in their education. That's great. And I love that you have implemented these tips. Do some of them come from tips that you've acquired as a mom as you were teaching your kids to read? Uh, definitely. I think, you know, we do everything we can to get them interested in books, right? And sometimes it's not easy. But I think, you know, keeping it fun is uh, always a great thing. And, you know, even if it means just picture walking a book with your child, like looking at a picture and asking them, oh, hey, there's Dream Big Little Pig. Like, what color is her dress? Or what is she doing? Is she playing basketball? And, you know, and it prompts them to kind of think and um, mm -hmm. answer and really get more involved with what they're reading. So you know, keeping it fun was, was one thing for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Kids are always, you know, playing and learn the best through play. So I love that, that playful approach to learning. Um, tell us about the children's books that you've written. Yes, no, absolutely. So um, there's three books. One is called Dream Big Little Pig. Uh, there it is, Poppy the Pig as you can see, uh, is interested in ice skating, where she tries a, a few different things before she finds ice skating. And uh, once she finds ice skating, she discovers she loves it. And so this one's all about persistence and uh, you know not giving up and going after your dreams, even though there's challenges in front of you. Uh, and then I also did a follow-up from this called It's a Big World, Little Pig. And then uh, Kara's Kindness is about a caring cat and uh, she passes kindness forward and only asks that her friends do the same thing and uh, you never know the the kindness can 
come full circle back to you. So, you know, each one has a little bit of a positive message that hopefully kids can take away and, and maybe uh, in, implement in their own lives. Yeah. And speaking of facing challenges, we have a question from Kushi from YouTube. Um, and she was asking, how do you keep how do you keep going on in spite of having low scores or performance? I'm assuming in regards to reading. Um, do you have mm. some ideas for us? Yes. Um, maybe, I'm, maybe a parent or maybe a teacher sounds like. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's like finding something that will inspire that child to really pick up books as much as possible. And, um, you know, I think it's important to have uh, options of choice because mm -hmm. when a child's able to pick and choose, they take a little bit of ownership of what they're reading. And I think that makes it a little more fun. And it's, you know, it might prompt them to read that book again and again, which is always great, um, or even maybe inspire them to find other books in that same subject. So, um, you know, I think choice and in, in letting them pick uh, is a big key to getting them interested and um, and maybe, you know, finding other fun ways to, um, you know, to get them reading, maybe even be outside. And if something interests them, like they see a truck go by and they're like, wow, look at that big truck. And you can say, let's go find some books about trucks and learn more about them. Uh, so, you know, little tricks like that, I think, uh, are great ways to get a, a child's interest in, in books. Even if they don't realize they're learning something, they are. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially for the youngest kids, I think. Uh, the songs and the rhymes have so much phonemic awareness skills that you can can build as you're uh, singing those songs and um, playing games too, I think with young, mm -hmm. young kids. So yeah, love that idea of having choice, I think with, with books, you know, hopefully now, you know, kids can find books that they're with subject matter interest that they're interested in and that, that can go a long way. Um, we have another question from Sam Lewis from YouTube. How do you press on when your faith is being tested beyond all you can give? And I, I, I hear him from, you know, these times during the pandemic, especially with young children at home, these are challenging times. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts about Sam? Yes, uh, yes, I, I, that's a tough one. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, we all face at some point in our lives and it's uh you know it's maybe finding ways to dig deep and see you know maybe what we do have instead of thinking of all the challenges and the hard things in front of us um you know taking stock in some of the the positive things that we do have and letting that lift you up a little more i know it's not necessarily going to change your situation but uh sometimes it's just you know, a different perspective mentally can sometimes uh, bring about a little bit of change or, you know, inspire change in, in, a, in a different way. But, um, you know, it, it, it is tough. I think leaning on people that are close to you and that you have a, a trust in. And I think don't be afraid to reach out because, um, you know, there are some incredibly you know, generous people out there in their hearts where they definitely want to, um, you know, give whatever advice or, you know, tips to, to help out. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question from there goes my uh, little dog. <laughs> Do you get to see your dog? <laughs> yes. Yes. We're, we're dog mom here. So you must see someone outside. <laughs> Um, we are all dog fans here on our team. Um, another question from Dia Sama from YouTube. What inspired you to be a figure skater? Ah, uh, yes. So basically, I had seen an ice skating show when I was younger, and I loved the music and the performances and the costumes of course as a little girl and um i think there was so much about skating that was magical and 
when I begged my mom to take me, actually something that ties in so perfect here is like she said, okay, well, when you're six and you learn to read, then I'll take you to the ice rink. So that was big and you know motivation for me to to get reading and and everything. And uh, from the first time I tried it at six years old, I just absolutely loved it and uh, kept asking to go back. And um, I think there was the freedom on the ice and the feeling of movement and kind of like skiing. You know, you feel the wind in your face and your hair, and uh, there's just something exhilarating about that. And you know, learning to do the jumps and the different um, moves on the ice was always a challenge, but you know, obviously incrementally just great rewards and that feeling of accomplishment when I was able to learn something new. So, uh, so yeah, lots of things in, inspired the, the skating. <laughs> That's fascinating. And I love that it was tied to reading from the beginning. It, clearly your, your mom shared the same values that you do. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> what were your favorite books at that age? Oh, okay. Good question. I'm trying to think. Well, I had this one little book called um, Bear's Birthday. <laughs> and it wasn't by a big publisher. I think it was actually like one of those books given out at Hallmark or something. Um, but it had a little bear that went on an adventure on his birthday and you can pull him out of each page and stick him into the new environment on the on the consecutive pages so it was a, a, always a lot of fun um i can think of other little bit books um as a kid that age i mean i remember you know maybe a little older loving charlotte's web and mm -hmm. yes if you see a pig connection there i did have a big thing about pigs so oh. um so of course charlotte's web was one of my favorites uh as i was more middle school age <laughs> Uh -huh. uh huh. Yeah. Well, you know, we've seen, and Yu Wang from YouTube asks us, you know, what do you think is the reason that little kids like to read the same book over and over again and related? How can we get them to explore different books? Oh, you know, actually, it's a good thing to read books over and over again. The repetition is uh, so good for kids, you know in that age range. And, you know, they'll hear the same words over and over and starting to comprehend things mm -hmm. a little bit more. So, you know, I definitely encourage reading books over and over. And we actually do that in our always reading program. Um, and, it, you know, if, if that's what they want to read as or have read to them, then at least they're hearing something, right? And, um, but, you know, I think if you find another book with a similar uh, character or uh, subject matter, you can introduce that and say, hey, this is just like, you know, such and such book. Let's see if there's like a new adventure in this that you'd be interested in. And, um, you know, I think no matter what it is, if you can get them, you know, interested in books, that's, that's the, that, the key. Um, but yeah, don't, don't worry about the repetition. It's, that, that's always a good thing. Absolutely. I'm there with you. I remember the days when our kids were young and we, for parents, it's, it seems very, very repetitive. I remember reading the same books over and over, night after night. Um, but in our work, we've also noticed that children, they'll read the same book, but they'll be looking at the pictures. And if you ask them questions, they may say something different the next time. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes we've seen that children start, even pre-reading, they will start reciting the book you know, because they'll remember it. Um, so that's all, you know, good and, and part of learning. So uh, yes, but, definitely. Yeah, like, the, like the tips on um, exploring different books as well. Um, Sam Lewis from YouTube has a question. May I ask how to keep a two year old still long enough to read to? Oh, <laughs> let's see. It's been a long time since my oh, kids no. were two. <laughs> They're 16 and 18 now. Um, you know, let him sit on your lap or her, him or her, and uh, look at the book, you know, feel the book. And I don't, you know, let them take charge. I think sometimes, you know, let them turn the page, maybe say, hey, can you, for example, good night moon, because that was one that 
our kids wanted to hear over and over and over and of course find the little mouse on every page so you know maybe make it a little bit of a game there like oh can you find the mouse on this page and it kind of occupies them i know two years old is it is maybe a little uh, i think they would understand that um but yeah i think it's you know five even five minutes if it you know is is enough to kind of start that and as they get older they might you, you know, you could probably build up to 10 minutes a day and uh, that even 10 minutes a day is going to make a huge difference in um, creating a, a really strong foundation for their literacy um, habits and skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes we can borrow from from teachers who are so good about setting up those reading routines in the school day. Sometimes at home, parents can you know, set aside some time for reading. So after dinner or before bed, um, children are growing up expecting that time. That sometimes helps too when they, mm -hmm. children generally like the routine, something yes. consistent. Yes, they do. Yeah, um, Sharon from Facebook asked us, do you have a variety of genres you prefer for your personal reading? Ooh, um, yeah, I kind of bounce all over the map. I mean, lately I've, kind of been going back to some like uh, more action and thriller. <laughs> I like a lot of spy novels and, you know, kind of the uh, like CIA kind of uh, type suspense ones. But then, uh, you know, I read a couple of great ones uh, over the summer um, where the crawdads sing. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar mm -hmm. with that. It was incredible book. And uh, so, yeah, I, I kind of like to explore all different things, but um, I know I definitely love adventure and uh, and even fantasy, like Lord of the Rings, that whole series is one of my favorite um, growing up. Mm -hmm. Great. So maybe now going back, back to your past in, in as a kid of children, um, in our demographic, how was your what was your training like when you were first starting out at six to eight years old? So you know, I mean, at six to eight, I was still kind of getting to know skating a little bit. So it was maybe you know going a couple times a week after school mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, and then maybe building up to a few times a week. Uh, so it wasn't real. Uh, you know, strenuous training at that point. Uh, maybe, you know, a little bit older when I was closer to middle school age, then I started going a little bit before school. So that's when the early morning started where my parents or, you know, my mom would get up early, take me for an hour or two before school and then sometimes after school. So I think that's, you know, more 11, 12 is when I started to get more serious and committed to really uh, focusing in on, on more training. Mm. And then over the years, as you competed, how did you build up the mental toughness that you needed um, to prepare for, you know, the, the pressure of being at the Olympics and being on a worldwide stage? It, I mean, it, it comes gradually, right? But I think, um, my coach was really incredible, Christy Ness, uh, at really preparing her students to mentally be tough in competition. And, uh, you know, she was a great technician and trainer that had us physically prepared, but also, you know, wanted us to be mentally tough as well. And so she, she was tough on us in training. Like she never let up and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say too much tough love, but a little bit. And, um, you know, she she would try to get us into that feeling and that uh, atmosphere of, uh, of a little bit of nerves in practice once in a while, especially when we would perform our, uh, practice our routines, just so that when we felt those nerves in competition, it was, you know, it wasn't something that was new and kind of, uh, you know, uncomfortable as well. It wasn't comfortable, but you know, you knew how to deal with it and you knew that, okay, even though I feel a little shaky, I can still go out there and uh, perform uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And what was it like being one of the first Asian American figure skaters representing the U.S.? Uh, well, I think I feel more of the impact now than I did at the time. You know, at the time I didn't know that. And, um, you know, I knew that at the very, very top world level, there were very few um, Asian Americans at the time. Uh, Tiffany Chin, who uh, won a bronze world medal and was U.S. national champion in the early 80s, was one of my big uh, idols and in, in role models. Uh, so. You know, I definitely looked to her and I felt that connection because she was also Asian American and a uh, California girl like me. Um, so, you know, I didn't really feel like, oh, you know, I'm trying to blaze a trail here. Like, oh, there's a lot of pressure. Um, I probably didn't really realize what had happened until, you know, after the Olympics and when mm -hmm. it was kind of brought more to my attention, like, oh, hey, you were the first Asian American to win a gold in uh, the Winter Olympics. I was like, oh, really? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, and I think when I saw, you know, how much it meant to the Asian American community, I think that's when I realized like, oh, wow, this is, um, you know, this, this does mean something. And I think it made me reflect a lot more and be uh, even more appreciative to, you know, the history of my, my family uh, here in the U.S. and and really the sacrifices and the, the trail that they blazed so that I could really live that American dream. Wonderful. Well, it's just been such an inspiration to have this conversation with you and to hear about all your, not only, you know, your Olympic history, but also your deep work um, with children in early literacy. So, Thank you so much, Christy, mm -hmm. for taking the time and sharing with our audience. And Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Caroline. It was so great to talk to you and an honor to talk to you, too. And, you know, just a huge fan of Khan Academy Kids and uh, just love love what you guys do, too, to encourage all of that early education because it's, it's so important. Well, thank you so much. And if folks want to uh, see this, um, just find this podcast um, wherever you get your, your podcasts and look for uh, Khan Academy Ed Talks. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Yeah.